morning. Happy Wednesday to all of you. Hope everyone's doing well and is having a great week and enjoying some maybe some slightly early spring weather. It's starting to get a little balmy here in Salt Lake. Um, it's my great distinguished pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, who's our visiting professor, uh, our first visiting professor for 2019, and also happens to be our keynote U.S. speaker for this Friday for those of you that are attending. I can remember one, you know, one of my favorite things to do at Ask Chris is when everybody's left the hall is to sit at a little computer terminal and just scroll through videos. <clears throat> the film festival is one of the highlights every year. And I can remember in 2016, I was looking through videos and I happened to come across this video by Dr. Yamani. And when I saw the video, before the voting had commenced, I knew right away that this was gonna be the winner. I just had a hunch that it was gonna be the grand prize winning video. And ever since then, Dr. Yamani has been on a worldwide tour of describing his technique, sharing his tips and pearls. But what we didn't know is that he happens to be an accomplished retinal surgeon as well. So today's topic is not what he's notably known for, uh, but I hope that you'll be uh, able to enjoy his talk and uh, be able to appreciate the innovation that he's bringing to this whole uh, uh, sphere. Uh, Dr. Yamani graduated from medical school from Yokohama University in 2002 and uh, went on to become a staff lecturer there, senior attending, and is now assistant professor there along with the senior lecturer at Yokohama University. Please help me welcome Dr. Yamani to our grand rounds this morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. And first, I want to apologize of my poor English, so if you can't understand or you have some question, please stop my talk and ask me. Today's talk is about uh, retinal surgery, not about IOL. I have no financial disclosures. I'm from Yokohama City University. Yokohama is uh, in the east part of Japan, near to Tokyo. Here, here is uh, Tokyo, and Yokohama is only 50 kilometers from Tokyo. This is our hospital. Oh. And our hospital is um, mainly treated in retina diseases. And he is our professor, Dr. Kadono Sono. He developed ICG staining of ILM. So we have many retina patients. I spe specialized in a both of cataract and retinal surgery. Yokohama is a very beautiful city with a harbor, beautiful harbor. So please come to Yokohama if you have any chance. So today's talk is about CLAO, Central Retinal Artery Occlusion. As you know, this disease has very bad natural cause. Most of cases result in um, the visual acuity less than hand and counting fingers. We do a um, massage or lower IOP for these patient. However, no effect of conservative treatment was revealed. Systemic plasminogen activator, TPA use is a choice of the good choice for this disease. However, the result is controversial. In addition, TPA has a severe um, complication as a several um, hemorrhage, so it's not easy to use. We developed uh, micro needles before. This needles, um, the tip of the, this needle is only 50 micrometers, so we can directly inject TPA to the central retinal artery. So we started the pilot study to inject the TPA for CLAO. 
This is a prospective non-comparative interventional case series. We included CRAO with onset of symptoms less than 48 hours. We excluded the cases with an other regional disease, glaucoma, giant cell arteritis, and recent strokes. We performed 25 gauge pulse plana vitrectomy, then the TPA was injected using microneedle. We evaluated visual acuity and blood flow, uh, evaluated with an FAG, OCTA, and an LSFG, laser spectrophotography. So the microneedle is very thin, and the inner diameter is only 20 microns, so we cannot push by hand, so we use um, VSC system for injecting uh, silicone oil. And after vitrectomy, we directly inject the TPA to the central lateral artery. So today I have uh, five cases. The first case is 70-year-old female. Her visual uh, acuity is at um, 0.01. We can find a typical um, cherry red spot. And in the OCTA, um, severe capillary defect was seen, especially in the inferior side. If we just show the, the base, very slow and um, blood flow, and upper side is not so bad, but um, inferior side is very severe. So this is surgical video. I penetrated the artery, central artery, and started to inject TPA. This procedure is very difficult because I, I can't move. <laughs> In this case, um, very few hemorrhage because of the low blood flow. After injecting TPA, the artery a little improved, but not so <coughs> significant. One month post-operatively, FAG showed an almost normal blood flow, and the visual acuity improved to 0 0.09. OCTA showed um, improve of the macular capillary, how, however, small capillary was still defected. The second case is 49-year-old male. His um, visual acuity was hand motion. Uh, no, uh, hand motion. If VG showed no blood flow and LSFG showed the same, no, no blood flow was seen. Then I started inject TPA. They're completely occluded, so the artery is um, turned white. I injected TPA about one month, um, no, one minute, but no blood flow was seen. So I decided to inject another point from another artery, but it was so difficult. So I injected to the central artery again. I was so disappointed because of no blood flow now.
but su suddenly the hemorrhage was occurring. <coughs> and un I found the clot is moving. This is one of the most effective cases. Case. So Dr. Yuan, yeah. So white we're seeing is that the CTA continuing to clot, or is that the clot like the white thing in the artery? Yeah. We're seeing what I think I had in my blood flow. Is that the clot or is that the CTA? Yeah. Clot. If that was a TPA, um, all blood uh, base cell goes white. So, <coughs> you can see TPA goes here. Now TPA is um, moving now. <laughs> Very different from clot. Fin finally, the blood flow was recovered. So we found a severe hemorrhage. So as you can see, spray injection, the artery was completely white, but it turned red after injection. One month postoperatively, the visual acuity recovered to 0.04. That was not so pretty good, but maybe if we did not do surgery, this patient visual acuity is almost like perception. If it showed a um, completely recovered blood flow, and LSFG showed a <coughs> recover of the blood flow, but the normal the fail eye has an um, about uh, thirty to forty, so this value is not normal. Uh, about half of the normal eye. The third case is 72-year-old male. His um, visual acuity was counting fingers. He has a ciliary artery, but it did, um, didn't um, cover the phobia. Only ciliary artery is um, remained and the Central retinal artery was completely of blue. <laughs> now the blood flow is almost complete, completely um, stopped. And after in injection, TPA is a artery turned white because now the TPA is filled in the artery. So the blood flow was recovered. Plain injection, you can see the stop of the blood flow, and after injection, the blood flow was recovered. 
one month's post-operative is the visuality was 0 0.02, still um, capillary dropout was seen in OCTA. FAG showed a recovery of the inferior side of the artery, but superior side of the blood flow is not good. LSFG showed an almost normal value of the blood flow, but the upper side was occluded. Three months post-operatively, visual acuity was recovered to 0 0.2. But the LSFG showed a reduce of blood flow compared to one, one month. One month and the value is 28. But at three months, it decreased to 9.4. We, we do not know why, but we speculate um, the ganglion cell loss um, reduce the uh, reduction of uh, um, decrease of uh, blood flow. Next case is 79 year old male. The Preoperative visual acuity was 0 0.01. We can see a um, chelar spot, but in OCTA, the blood flow of the macula is not so bad. But if I see the FAG and LSFG, the blood flow is almost completely occluded, and this is about 10 minutes from injection, but <coughs> The um, fluorescence was not coming to the artery. In this patient, one month postoperatively, um, the visual acuity was significantly improved to 0 0.9. And amazingly, at three months, the visual acuity was um, over 2020. So now I, I think um, macular blood flow is very important for um, visual prognosis. The final case is a 75-year-old male, and he has no light perception. And uh, OCTA showed almost no blood flow in macular area. We did the same surgery, but the blood flow was not recovered in this case. One month postoperatively, um, the visual acuity is was um, hand motion and almost no recover of um, blood flow. Three months postoperatively, the blood flow was uh, recovered, but the optic nerve was turned white and the visual acuity remained to hand motion. I performed this surgery on 15 eyes of 15 cases. The average age was in 70.9, and 12 cases of male and three cases of female. The visual acuity was significantly improved two weeks, one month, and three months postoperatively. The average baseline logma was 2.1, and it comes um, 1.4, three months postoperatively. Um, three. Three cases uh, showed no change of um, visual acuity at three months, but uh, others are recovered. We, we speculate, um, earlier, speculated earlier surgery is better for patient, of course. However, the result was not, 
was reversed. And this is a period from onset to uh, surgery, and this is a visual acuity. Amazingly, um, longer longer term case was um, has better visual acuity. We we don't know why, and. The improvement of the visual acuity is almost same, and um, not depend on the time timing of surgery. The effect of surgery for blood flow may depend on size and the type, size, and position of embryo. So, if the embryo is very large or very deeper positioning, uh, it's difficult to remove. The visual prognosis may be influenced not only by period after onset, but also by the macular blood flow and nerve damage. So in conclusion, retinal and vascular surgery is effective for restoring blood flow and vision in CLAO. Now, we want to find which patient can recover and which will not. So we think an OCTA is a good tool to find the patient with a good visual prognosis. So in FAG, this, these two cases has a completely um, occlusion of um, central retinal artery. However, the OCTA showed very different macular blood flow. And this case recovered to 2020, but this case is on only hand motion. So we now use OCTA for a CLAO patient. And we must think about using uh, other drugs and to um, remove the em emboli. And some doctors, and this is uh, not for human, but um, Prasmin is uh, effective to remove the emboli, he said. And maybe prevention of apoptosis by neuro protective drugs are very effective. So we want to combine with our surgery and the new drugs in the future. So retinal and vascular surgery can perform, perform using microneedle and may effective for CRAO, but um, we have a limitation, so we should be combined with the new drugs. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Yeah. Yes? Are you preparing an RCT? Are you preparing a randomized control trial? No, this is not randomized. So, so I, I think the issue that, that would be raised is, is that uh, uh, clearly you're showing that there's some improvement, is that, is that the most powerful evidence is, is in comparison to what results you're getting from treatment with what the natural history might be. Yes. And until, until people see that, then they're saying, well, it's, it's hard to know how much was a treatment effect and how much was just a, a natural history outcome of the disease? Yes, but we have uh, only small cases, uh, Belair disease, so we, we cannot conduct a randomized clinical trial. Yes, so there's right. other ways of looking at this. Um, have, have you, I mean, if you're, if you're gonna submit a paper, you, you would wanna try to get a control group of some type 
of those who didn't have treatment? I mean, it's not nearly as strong, but some type of a cohort comparison. Have yeah. you considered doing that? What what does a what 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 is the natural history of people who did not get this tr and try to get so that that there is as comparable as possible to at least show that it, it would appear as though this is an effect above the natural history of the disease. So so have you got it? I mean I I mean there's clearly plenty of people who've not been treated with surgery with TPA and and and, and those kind of curves I think are, are would be extremely important to at least suggest uh, that that you know that this this is something that's a, that's important to be tried. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a time limit following when the patients have their um, onset of symptoms um, until you can do an injection? I mean, is there a limit of a certain amount of hours or days uh, before you go in and try to do the injection? Yes, and we. We define to the 48 hours in this study, but as I showed, and the result was not. Um, it's what we call counterintuitive. Yeah. We would expect the longer you go, the worse your results. And you're showing that as you get out towards 48 hours, you actually had potentially better results, which is a, what we call a head scratcher, meaning. Well, that that's hard to explain that. Yeah. Do you have any idea why? I mean, typically, our, and, and it's more than just theoretical. I mean, the evidence is pretty clear. If, if you're not getting blood flow, what we say is the clock is ticking and things are starting to die. And so you're going to get to a point where the damage is done and you can't resolve it anymore. And yet this would indicate that even up to two days later, yeah. you have the potential for return. That, that's uh, maybe just your number. What, what was your p-value for this? you know what the p-value for your, for your regression line was? Um, I'm, I'm not sure, but this was is it, only a small case. Was the p-value so. statistically significant? Because this could just be random. I mean, th th in other words, th 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 it just so happened that on a few cases, you have a line that doesn't fit with, with any particular theory just because it's it's you know it's it's not significant it's it's not it's yeah. it's a, a, a random outlier and th there's going to be a regression to the mean and over time that we'll get the line we expect which is that the longer you wait the worse the outcome I, I'm just looking at those numbers and what you have I, I'd be surprised if that if that regression line is statistically significant yeah. so I think we probably need more numbers to know if that's a real finding yeah. Yes. Paul, would you agree with that? Well, I would say that it might be statistically significant if you did the non-parametric tests, but or the but I think the interesting thing that he showed and that would you'd want to correlate is what the OCTA showed. Because sure. I think some of these people that are way out there have got macular they, blood flow. Going. Right. They have kind of a stuttering onset and a little bit of blood's getting through. So they're surviving. So, yeah. So I think that So OCTA may explain you. Yeah, what's I'd the really look at yeah. that very closely and okay. see. Yeah. How stable is that? Because are they true hard stop CRAOs versus because if they were fear, fear, if they were full hard stop, it's hard to explain why they yeah. would be getting yeah. yeah. Yes, and we it's difficult to evaluate the macular blood flow by FAG, but OCTA showed a good data. Yeah. Well, it's fascinating, and it's a disease that certainly uh, you know there have been lots of different things people have tried. Over time, I mean, uh, back when I was a resident, it was not uncommon. You tried to tap the anterior chamber to suddenly lower the pressure, and there were certainly anecdotal cases where, you know, that would work. But as a regular treatment, that's pretty well fallen into disfavor. And so, uh, a better treatment for these medical emergencies, these these ophthalmic emergencies, would certainly be a, a, a real positive. Um, so I, it. it it would be good to get you know more people involved in, in trying to get a, a better handle of larger numbers against natural, yeah. at least for a cohort study. I agree, there, there are few enough now, any single individual could not yeah. do a randomized clinical trial. But I think in order to consider one, there ought to at least be a pretty well controlled cohort study of natural, natural history yeah. without treatment to suggest that the effect is, is at least moderately robust. Yes. 
Yes. Judith. So just to sort of bring things into our local realm here, I mean, I think that there have been lots of studies of uh, attempting to acutely treat uh, central renal artery occlusion uh, as if it's a stroke in the, in the brain, just similar parameters. And uh, there's a lot of controversy out there as to whether or not it's effective. I or intra-arterial, uh, they can cannulate this, the um, ophthalmic artery fairly easily and geographically. Uh, obviously, um, an intra-arterial injection intracranially is, um, carries significant risks, as does IV or intra-arterial TPA given uh, systemically because of risk of hemorrhage in various body parts. But uh, I think that the, the current uh, status is that if you have a patient with a central artery occlusion who turns up in the emergency room and you can get them examined quickly uh, and confirm that that's what the diagnosis is, that, uh, that many of the neurology stroke attendings are treating that as a stroke and they will give intravenous uh, TPA uh, as, uh, uh, as a sort of mm, kind of on a compassionate use basis. Um, it, it's much harder to uh, go to the intra-arterial route, um, although some studies suggest that that might be more effective when a, a TPA, when the uh, CRAO is a little bit longer. But, you know, we're really talking, just like stroke, six hours for IV and maybe eight to ten hours after onset. Uh, because of, uh, as Dr. Olson was saying, you know, time is retina, I guess, in this case. So are we doing that here? I mean, yeah. we, right now that's happening. And, and generally, if it's within six hours, they're doing intravenous. I, and if you're sitting between six to ten, is that is that something you'd say is routinely being happen, happening now? It's or? not routine because they're, um, first of all, it's, it's not very common for people to come in within a couple of hours of onset of their vision loss. And then they do have to be examined and, you know, all the, um, the stars have to be aligned to get this to actually occur. But it is, it is something that can, can be done, uh, basically calling a brain attack, um, is, is what they call it. So. Judith, you know, we've got a cadre of interventional radiologists now that are good at running catheters up to the ophthalmic artery. That's how we deliver intra-arterial chemotherapy for retinoblastoma. And it may be a, you know, something to think about, not if anybody's doing it, but using that to get TPA closer to where you need it a little bit upstream from what you're doing. So and that was what that was what I was referring is that what to. They're doing interarterial yeah, interarterial yeah. they're delivering it there. Yeah. Okay. Not through the, the eye, but through the ophthalmic artery. Cool. Good stuff. Unfortunately it comes up so infrequently that um, it's a bit of a hullabaloo every time it happens. Right. But um, you know, under the right circumstances it can occur. But it's a it's a, a a constant ongoing debate. I think that that although there have been studies suggesting that it doesn't work, there are um, many people who say that those studies were not Long. done properly, um, and that uh, they allowed people in who were well outside the realm of when there's even any possibility that it would work theoretically. So uh, that that uh, uh, just like with with stroke. Time is of the essence. So it seemed to me that uh, because it is infrequent enough that maybe something, somebody, a group like Nanos, try to get together a group to answer uh, with, with enough numbers to, to, to try to look at these different approaches to see if we can't get a better handle. Because it, it's, it's rem my understanding is it remains a bit controversial and, and that it's, it's out there and it's a big unknown. And so it's a bit hit and miss exactly what happens in association with this diagnosis, particularly when you pick it up acutely. But our policy is we do treat with TPA, typically intravenous and intraarterial if it's after six hours, but no less than 10. That's... I, I think that's off the top of my head, the recollection. I could, I could certainly... Dr. Katz has been involved in, quite involved in sort of forming the protocol with the stroke, uh, the stroke team. Uh, do you remember... Um, 
sorry, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember exactly the numbers, but uh, I can certainly uh, uh, forward the policy to Susan so that she could maybe uh, distribute it widely to the faculty and residents. Do, do any of the residents who've been on current with recently remember? Or, I mean, just, like I say, it just doesn't come up, you know, maybe once or twice a year where something happens early enough, early enough that it could even potentially occur. Do you know, Jean? No, I mean, it's what they want them within two hours. Yeah. Does anybody know? No, there was, there was, was about a year ago that I read the articles on it, and I think it was a two to four percent intracranial hemorrhage risk. Right. And so the recommendation was not to do it because the nasal acuity gain was so little. Well, that's what some of the studies have suggested, that it was not statistically significant. And right. so exposing someone to a two percent risk of a brain bleed So it sounds like now that we have this new technology and with the paper you have, which I would strongly recommend that you put a big emphasis on the impact of the OCTA picture of the macula in association with outcome, yeah. that there's a new variable here that should be considered and this is something that, that you know, someone ought to pick up as a, as a multi-center trial, as a study to try to answer that question. There's no single center in the United States is going to have enough numbers to be able to you know, answer that question in a timely fashion. The other problem is that, if, as, and I think that our retina colleagues could comment on this, is that generally speaking, fluorescing angiograms uh, improve after central retinal artery occlusions anyway. Um, you know, a month later, you might not be able to use a fluorescein uh, as a helpful tool for diagnosing a month ago. Uh, central retinal artery occlusion because blood flow does normalize but or does improve quite a bit but it, it, it's um, a, a pyrrhic victory if um, because the, the <laughs> optic nerve is chalky white and there's right and the retina there. is uh, wrong. <coughs> I, I, Paul do you no no I agree and I think you know since we have OCTA I think both in neuro op and retina that should be our first line because you can get that and they can be done right. that's in the, five that's minutes the and we can send them on to the yeah. emergency room rather than an FA and getting approval and getting it done, you know, that, that slows things down. No CTA is fast. And probably from what your work has done, uh, prognostically may easily be yeah. far and away more important. I think we should, that should be standard now. Yeah. I'd recommend mm -hmm. that for sure. Well, well I, think, I think that uh, if, if Brad's the one, let's, let's have someone here to help us so that we've got a, a consistent policy on that. And then I highly recommend that, you know, somebody back at Nano's probably start talking together and yeah you know they've they've had point counterpoints in uh, I can I can forward that stuff as well it's I mean this is obviously a, a huge topic of discussion when you get to the national meetings but then and then you have sort of ongoing debate on our on our list sort of discussions and things um, you know it's is there a national champion who's really been interested in this uh, yeah there are there are um, uh, Valerie Buse is a very strong uh, proponent of um, treating um, arterial events in the eye like arterial events in the brain. Right, right. Okay. I, know, I know it's been a big debate in regards to preferred practice patterns and uh, the academies involved. Yeah, in I think I, that you have I've gotten in the middle of that about some almost knockdown drag out battles between yeah, different it's, groups. It's, it's like that. But I think you have plenty of uh, support for not doing anything because I think that there's plenty of, plenty of naysayers in, in, in the literature. Mike, would you? Yeah, on Pulse, there, we do have a protocol for the PRAO presentation, and it, it's called the, if it's less than eight hours, um, that it can be diagnosed, like they get an ophthalmology consult, and we say it is a PRAO, and that's what we call the brain attack. It doesn't say whether or not to give TPA protocol, but then it's call the brain attack. Well, I think we should add OCTA to that. I, it, 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 at least theoretically makes a lot of sense. And over time, I think it should be pretty clear what it's going to tell us in regards to the prognosis. So this is where things get complicated because um, uh, I would say that probably the majority of people with severe acute vision loss like that end up in the emergency room rather than coming to the retina clinic. And then when you start transporting them to the Moran for a whole bunch of diagnostics, then, you know, the clock is ticking. And so there's a huge, uh, there's a huge uh, uh, 
debate or conflict or weighting of interest between time and diagnostic tests. So they don't have an OCTA in the emergency room, and uh, you know even even pausing for a dilated exam is that's time. You know that's a half an hour of of you know of time that the uh, that is is going by. So um, theoretically, yes. But Practically, what you're yeah, saying and, is... Yeah, and that's one of the problems with these protocols is they, you know, that, oh, we're going to do a study of this, and then, you know, everybody gets involved in there. Oh, well, while we're doing that, we should do this test, and we should do that test, and then, you know, tick-tock, you know... In an off-hour situation. Yeah. Setting. Yeah, I've never been told to get an OCTA. I mean, with Brad and with the stroke neurology team, I've been told if I see a central retinal artery occlusion or a branch retinal artery occlusion, even I believe it's within seven days that I should notify the stroke team at least so the patient gets a rapid workup and not a delayed workup over a week. They can do the workup in 24 hours, um, you know, so. Um, well, we don't have Brad here. Let's just Brad, Brad but there, it, it, it is a sub, it's a test can be done relatively rapidly and, and it, it, it would not surprise me that it has important prognostic implications. So, we're not going to solve that here, but I think I think Brad's. Well, we got an OCTA for the uh, the neurology ICU. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Any, not that we want to bring up any. Any, any other thoughts or questions? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.